right. Just me between you and lunch, so I'll go ahead and get started real quick. Um, first, I want to ask you guys a question. Which of these do you think is the classroom of the future? Neither. Yeah, neither. <laughs> That's okay. Neither. Yes. What do you think? Uh, who, who thinks it's the one on your guys' left? Yeah, I think it's the wall. And the right? How about the right? Yes, All right. All right. It could be online as well. All right. I'm going to say the answer is both. And I'm going to say it depends on how much money you have. But I'm going to say it's not maybe what you're thinking. That it's going to be poor kids are going to be forced to rely on cheap technology, have things like $30 Amazon tablets, while rich kids will have ex access to the really expensive teachers. Sadly, we're kind of seeing this today. Have you guys heard of the Waldorf School in Silicon Valley? No technology at all. All the tech uh, giants are sending their kids to a school that has no technology. Um, I think Dragon mentioned the Next Generation Learning Challenge grant that uh, one of your colleagues was working on. Well, uh, they had a Wave 3 grant where they were trying to create a degree for $5,000 or less. And uh, several people, the first time they sent out that uh, RFP, no one responded. Uh, since then, Georgia Tech is trying to do that and offer an online degree for $5,000. Several other people are trying to do the same. We're seeing the MOOC. The MOOC phenomenon is definitely this push. And, and it's not always, it isn't just about money and time. It's also about people's time and how, how they can access things. Uh, and people do want stuff to go online because it's easier access. And we're seeing this growth of adaptive technology companies that are automating some of this stuff. So for me, it's a huge motivation that this isn't, we can't really stop it. It has to do with economics that will force this route to happen. So we have to focus on improving learning technology and make it available to everyone because it's just, that's the way it's going to happen. So collecting data is really the way to do it and give new ways to improve teacher-student access to this uh, technology. We want to see adaptive features to learning software. <clears throat> and it can't just be done with simple one-time experiments where we have A and B studies in a classroom. We need to do it at scale, and to do that, we need data and big data. Um, so a lot of my work has uh, benefited from uh, a uh, center called the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center which um, was a $50 million NSF-funded center between Carnegie Mellon University and the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, it was created to bridge this chasm between science and practice and actually get things into the classroom. Um, notably, uh, IES, had, uh, our uh, Department of Education, had a study that showed that uh, less than 10% of randomized field trials that were taken from the lab and done in the actual classroom were actually successful. So the, the idea of the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center was to create these learn labs, which would be these social technical bridges between lab studies and schools. And did a lot of e-science e, uh, e on the uh, science of learning and looking at education. A lot of social processes. Carolyn uh, did a lot of work with collaborative supportive stuff. And so how can we, uh, the purpose was really to leverage this theory and computational modeling to identify conditions that cause robust student learning. And as part of the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center, we created DataShop. And um, DataShop was an, originally envisioned as a place for all the studies that came through the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center to store their data and also give a set of tools for people to analyze that data. Um, so it kind of has two parts, both the central repository and a set of analysis tools. And today, DataShop has grown um, quite a bit larger and is not only collecting data from studies, but is actually collecting data from things like our online courses at CMU. Um, and it has grown to uh, the largest open repository of educational data 
from transactional systems such as intelligent tutoring and online courses. And you can see we have uh, about 250 million individual student actions, uh, which equates to about 675,000 hours of student data in a bunch of different domains. Um, and originally, again, it was based on these domains that we studied in the Learn Lab, different languages, uh, math, um, data from our intelligent tutors at CMU, um, some of our partners like Carnegie Learning, which is a CMU spinoff that does math learning. Um, we have data from online courses, particularly our open learning initiative, as well as data from games and simulation. And it's really fine-grained data at a very low transaction level. Um, so one of the things that we're able to do in DataShop is track learning by tracking what we call knowledge components. And a knowledge component could be thought of as a skill or a concept or fact. Um, in fact, we, we originally used the term skill, and some uh, psychologists and uh, psychometricians and others kind of were saying, well, what you're really tracking is a skill. So we came up with this term knowledge component to kind of appease people. And, and it really describes a piece of information that we can track in a system to accomplish tasks so we can show learning. And it's tagged at what we call the step level. And that's really like a problem uh, broken down into a single action that the student can do, like filling in a prompt to answer a question, or clicking on a button or a drop down. And when you take these knowledge components and map them back to these steps, you create what we call a KC model. And so that's really just a skill model or a cognitive model of a piece of educational technology, a piece of instruction. It's a mapping of all the steps that the student would go through and solve to the different skills that they're learning in there. And this mapping gives us this uh, correct step knowledge component thing that we can track then learning over time. And it's important that we get this KC model right. So the KC model can drive adaptive learning. Um, we can do things, if it's, if it's a good model, we can use it to do things like problem uh, selection, choose the sequence of problems, give instructional messages based on what students know and don't know. And particularly in all systems, we can use it to track knowledge and say we have a good understanding of what we think that student knows or doesn't know. So what makes a good KC model? I would say a good KC model is one that is consistent with the student behavior, predicts the difficulty of the task, and uh, primarily it should uh, predict the transfer between instruction that we're given the students and then a pre and post test so we can see that the students are learning. And ideally, that if all these work, the model should fit the data that we have. So to do this, to figure out if we have a good KC model, we can look and see if it has good learning curves. So a learning curve is simply an empirical basis for determining whether this KC model is good. Accurate predictions of the student and task performance should show learning transfer. And repeated practice on tasks involving the same skill should reduce the error rate in those tasks, so we should see uh, students learning. So if we're looking at a uh, learning curve of, of, of error rate to student opportunity, we should see a declining curve emerge. So this would be an example of a good learning curve where the um, y-axis is the error rate, the um, x-axis is the axis is the opportunity. And as you can see, as the students get more opportunities to solve the problem, on average, this would be a group of students solving the problem. We see the error rate overall is occurring, uh, declining. And we would probably say this instruction looks good. And again, we can see if that matches our pre and post test uh, hypothesis. And if it does, we can say, yeah, this looks like it's doing what we're doing. Um, unfortunately, not all learning curves look this good. Sometimes they're flat or go upwards and, you know, uh, different, different uh, things can happen, which I'll talk about shortly. But how do we originally make these models? So um, traditionally, we've used cognitive task analysis. Um, but CTA, it definitely does have some issues. One, it's very human driven. Um, and second, it's highly subjective. We bring a bunch of different people in to make a mapping of the skills or even define the skills in a particular set of instruction. We'll get very different answers. Um, so we can get these uh, a lot of different results. And then probably the worst problem about this is when we go back and fit these models to the data, it's almost always wrong. The, 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 the human discovered model doesn't necessarily fit the data. 
So if human-centered intuitive design is not the answer, how should we design these models? And I would say we shouldn't design them. They should be discovered. The actual model is out there in the data. We just need to discover it. So we can use the data. And here's an example. We're generating all this log data from educational technologies. You guys are doing that here as well. Um, this is a great opportunity to harness this data, validate and improve the models that we have. Um, so uh, myself and uh, Ken Keating, my colleague at CMU, um, developed this method that we could use the learning curves and the KC models to find a uh, good way to see where we can find improvements in these models. And we came up with three main strategies for finding improvements to a student model. One, we want to look and find cur learning curves that aren't smooth, so they might be jagged. That might say there's something wrong with the questions. It might say there's something wrong with how we define those uh, skills or knowledge components. Another way would be no apparent learning. That means we have a flat curve. Um, and then the third thing would be unexpected error rate. So um, one problem seems to be significantly harder than the other when we tag both of those with the exact same skill or skills. So here's an example of producing a learning curve. So imagine I have a set of instruction um, that's on geometry. And we just tag every opportunity that the student has to uh, do any problem in that as they're learning the skill of geometry. Well, that seems somewhat feasible. That's what we're trying to do. But if we map that single skill to the um, data that we get, we get a curve that looks like that red data up there. It's all over the place. It doesn't look like a nice smooth learning curve. So that's probably not the right model. So the single uh, KC model is one end of the spectrum. On the other end, we could go to like every single opportunity that the student has is its own KC or its own skill. And that would be sort of the other end of the spectrum. A little more complicated because we could have multi coded uh, multiple skills per uh, step. But somewhere in between there, there's probably a, a model that would make this look good. And so the single skill geometry, we get no smooth learning. If we use another model where we have 12 skills, and the skills are things like circled area, circle, circumference, parallelogram area, et cetera, we apply this model to the same data, and suddenly we get the smoother looking curve. And this really amazes me every time because you, you can actually see this happen. And as you're, as you're improving your model over time, you see these smooth curves happening. And it, it, it always amazes me that it works. Um, you'll see in this case, it's not exactly a declining curve. In the end, it's going up a little bit. Um, this happens to be adaptive learning. So as students are performing, they're dropping out and learning the skills. So at the end there, it actually looks like they're not learning. but they, those are really just the students who are not getting it, and they may, may have other problems, like they just don't have the uh, prerequisite skills to get through these problems. But is this the best model that we can come up with? Well, even though that overall curve didn't look too bad, if we look at the individual curves of those individual skills that compose it, we see that some of them look pretty good. They're still kind of uh, uh, declining error rate curves. Um, but not, some of them aren't as good. In fact, this one composed by addition looks really bad, and this is an opportunity where we can improve this model. You also notice the parallelogram area down there um, is really flat, so it's like showing no learning happening. But the error rate is also really low. So that's, that's, that's actually another opportunity to quickly fix, uh, fix the system, because we're obviously giving students way too many parallelogram problems. They already know that skill. So we could cut that off and give them, change the parameters and give them less, uh, less of those problems and probably save a lot of student time. But back to composed by addition. So composed by addition is the skill where you're finding the area of composite shapes, like the area of the side of the house where it's a square and a triangle. Um, and for some reason, it looks like students weren't learning this. Um, and when we actually go into the data, we see it has a zero slope as well, so it appears there's no learning happening. Um, so what we, we actually hypothesized is that some of those blips in there, it actually is maybe more than one skill 
in, in the actual learning curve. So maybe there's actually multiple skills embedded in that single curve. And when we actually went back and looked at some of the points in there that were high, and if you were in my tutorial, I kind of showed this, um, you could drill down and look at the problems. And it turned out in some of those composed by area problems, it would say, find the area of the side of the house that's composed by a square and a triangle. And other problems would say, find the area of the side of the house. And it didn't say anything about a square and a triangle. So we hypothesized there was this additional skill involved where the student had to uh, decompose the shape in those harder problems and say, oh, this is two shapes. Um, so we went ahead and added that skill to those problems. Didn't change any of the instruction or anything. Went back and reevaluated it. And we got better AIC, BIC values. So AIC and BIC, a copy information criteria, invasion information criteria, are just some uh, methods we can use to compare models. Um, and by showing that it's a better fitting model, that kind of suggests that there is some, something there and maybe we should split the skill. So what does the better fit really mean? It means the new model should be better at driving this, the instruction to students. So if we went back and re-ran with this new model, we should get a more optimal problem selection algorithm in this adaptive learning. But it does require redesign of the technology so we can actually access these new findings. So we actually did this and uh, suggested resequencing the problems based on adding this new skill. We put the ones that had the single skill first and then the harder ones second. Um, we changed the knowledge tracing algorithm by adding the new skills in there. And we created new tasks that isolated that planning part of the problem. So we asked us, we weren't actually asking the students to solve all the problem, but we wanted to isolate that part and say, how would you solve this problem? And it was actually a multiple choice question. They had to say, oh, this is two shapes. And then we had to change instructional mess messages and feedback and hints. So it's not all data driven, it's data driven, but it does require some work. This process does require some work. Um, and then we went ahead and we re-ran the um, cognitive tutor geometry portion that we did. And we actually did a experimental group and, um, uh, and, and the normal condition, so the, the one had the old skill model that they had been using for some time, and the new one added this new skill. And we added this new knowledge tracing for the decomposing uh, shape skills, uh, created some new tasks and changed the instructional messages. And what we saw is that our control using the original tutor um, versus the treatment. Um, the uh, treatment group solved the, the entire lesson in 25% less time, which is pretty significant. Um, you can also see that the students spent considerably more time on these composition uh, skills that were a little bit harder um, in, in, the, in the treatment as it compared to the control. Um, and then in the, po in, in the post test, we saw a significant increase in learning of those composition skills. Um, slight decrease in the, actual, the other uh, more general area skills, but it wasn't significant. Um, so it suggests that we can do a couple of things. We can improve the time that students are uh, learning, and we uh, increase their learning overall. Imagine if we can do that across everything. We could take a four-year degree and make it in three years. So uh, it, it definitely could have some big impacts doing some small little things like this. This was one skill in, in a lesson. Um, so now uh, we went back and said, hey, can we help our faculty do this automatically? So within DataShop, we've done this categorization where we show uh, different types of curves, whether they're lower flat, whether we see no learning, whether there's too little data, uh, high error rates. And we can automatically help the instructors see these learning curves uh, and help them improve their courses overall. And we're actually doing this with a lot of our uh, instructors at CMU who are using our open learning initiative, whose data flows right into DataShop. So can this process be automated even more and can we bring it to scale? And the answer is yes, we can. And to do that, we're going to combine some cognitive science, psychometrics, machine learning. We want to collect this rich body of data that we're already driving in and develop some discovery algorithms and visualizations and support to help people figure out how, how uh, to better improve these models. 
So how can we discover the cognitive models from data? So what we do is we create this Q matrix, which is simply a mapping of the uh, item, the skills that we have and the items we're seeing. So you can see kind of a example Q matrix here. We have some items that people would solve, two times eight, two times eight minus three, and we have different skills that are attached to those. And if that skill appears in that question, you can put a one there. So you can see the first one has multiplication. The second one has subtraction and multiplication. The third has also has subtraction and multiplication. And the final one has addition and multiplication. Can you guys think of any other skills that might be present in those items? Oh, order of operations, that would be a good one. Here's some others. Anyone, anyone? All right, so yeah, so um, dealing with order of operations, also dealing with negative numbers, that third one there would give you a negative number that might confuse some people. So what we could do is add these uh, additional learning factors in. Um, do they give us a better fit? They probably would, but uh, you could just see. And what we will do then is if we have multiple models that different people have proposed, such as the uh, through the CTA process or something like that. We can combine them using matrix map, holding them in, merging columns, splitting on columns, and do that in an automated way and then test the fit and see if we get a better fit. And so we use this logistical regression model uh, called the additive factors model that will do our prediction and we'll use that to drive, um, drive the process and evaluating with either BIC or AIC or just regular cross-validation to try to see if we can reduce fit by changing these models. And we have what we call the learning factors analysis model search process. And we start with our original one and then we can split on a different skill and see if we get a better score. Go down and we, 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 we've tried several different algorithms. I think this one is using just a, a typical A-star algorithm that just goes through and, and does a search. Um, we both, we've both we guided by both BIC and AIC. Um, our research has shown that AIC more closely matches um, the item level uh, uh, cross-validation um, that we've done. And so, uh, and we use BIC and AIC because those are faster than doing cross-validation overall. And we basically will load these on the supercomputer at the Pittsburgh Supercomputing Center and we'll let these run for about three hours and get something, some millions of uh, models generated. And um, it basically automates this process of hypothesizing these alternative cognitive models and testing them. But it also, we're using human labeled models. So when we're splitting and joining, we have some human tagging of that. So we can actually follow back and figure out if, if it makes sense later on, as opposed to some of the other automated methods out there that would generate these unlabeled models. So instead of being square area, circle area, you get things like skill one, skill two, and they're very hard to interpret sometimes. And so we ran this and, and we'll get, we, we've run this on a bunch of uh, data sets. And sometimes if you go out and look at KC models in the data sets in CMU, you'll see we'll have these human generated models um, and, but we'll also have these uh, machine learned models. And uh, we did a test um, when we first ran this in 2012 on uh, 12 different data sets or 11 different data sets. Um, and you can see they're in very different content areas from geometry to story problems to fractions, equation solving, English articles and statistics. And in it, uh, my uh, circle disappeared. They switched it to. Google uh, Google display from that PowerPoint. But um, if you look, the best uh, learning factors analysis model actually improved in every single one of these models. And um, in most cases, we found that uh, we can find better learned models. Um, and in some of these, we've actually been able to trace back and see what they are. And, and they, they, have, they have turned out to be real discoveries. Um, and I can talk about a few of those. Um, but when you get these better, better models, what does it mean? So the new model basically has a better fit to the data. It should be better at driving instructions. So simply doing something like problem selection in an in a, uh, adaptive system, you should get better in instruction. Um, and because we've done it 
by starting with human tag models. They should be uh, human readable. And so uh, um, one of the examples that I talked about in the workshop I did yesterday, so uh, there was a question about whether or not we could collapse things like square area and rectangle area. Should those be different skills or the same skills? And again, some of this depends on when you're teaching the students. So early on, it appears that those should be different skills. But as students have already learned all those equations, really all of the um, area formulas fold into one with the exception of circle area. Um, and uh, we also found that you could merge um, working forward, so finding the area versus finding the size of the triangle uh, from the area. Um, all of those work as well with the exception of circle. Um, which circle have you, you have to do a square root when you're working backwards, uh, which seems to be a definite uh, differentiator. Um, but yeah, so it, it, the, this, this method should work. Um, I will say that when we first ran it on some of the open learning initiative course, um, we actually found some better models and we were pretty excited to tell the instructors and we were like, hey, our machine learning algorithm found a better model than yours. And they were like, uh, I don't think so. And uh, it, it actually, we, we found you really have to approach the teachers in a way that you're bringing them in and say, hey, look, we can improve. You want to help us improve this? Let's, you guys want to run this on the uh, algorithm and see if we get some uh, insights? Or Because, uh, yeah, they, they typically think they have a pretty good model uh, when they've done it uh, hand human driven. Uh, so what's next? Um, I've got another couple other projects that I'm working on to kind of extend this work. Um, one of them is called Learning Linkages. And this is a uh, joint project with uh, Arizona State University, uh, Danielle McNamara and uh, Jody Davenport at West Ed. And what we're trying to do is how can we better integrate multiple streams of data and join them up? And in particular, we've collected some rather large data sets in uh, math learning, in an algebra tutor, and in a chemistry um, uh, chemistry lab simulation, where we have log data from these intelligent tutors, but we also capture screen captures and video data. And kind of the idea, the the idea came out of this question uh, that we uh, had been posing: uh, How much does log data really tell you? And um, so what we've been able to do with that is actually create some scripts that if you see something weird, like in the learning curve, we can actually go out and uh, assign a section of time around that particular question and pull out the content from every single student's uh, um, screen capture and their webcam. And you can quickly see some things that are happening that are kind of weird. Um, and uh, uh, Real quickly, we found several problems in the uh, in, in the actual software that the developers hadn't noticed uh, in one case for many, many years, uh, where students were appearing to get something wrong that seemed weird. And when we actually went and looked at it, the students would answer what was the right answer, but it would flag it wrong, but it would move them to the next question, so they never knew they got it wrong. And it was actually a bug in the system. Um, we also found some cases where the um, students' log data did not predict their post-test, and we thought that was kind of weird. So we went and looked and pulled those streams of data, and we had it, we, we had multiple instances of this where you would have one student uh, sitting there, and for every single question, he was asking his neighbor what the answer was. And uh, so now we're trying to see, if, can we use that data and that knowledge that we pulled from the webcams that students were doing this to actually uh, figure that out through the log data that students are basically gaming the system or uh, not doing their own work. Uh, that's a pretty difficult problem, but we'll see if we can do that. Um, I also have a project with uh, Noburo Matsuda um, at Texas A&M University where we're trying to um, improve student learning in the online courses by applying a lot of these techniques and building a dashboard. Uh, to uh, help help teachers as they're teaching it um, uh, for online courses and for MOOCs. And then if you were in my workshop yesterday, one of the biggest projects that we're now working on is what I call the Next Generation Data Shop, which is literally uh, a infrastructure 
to take in uh, existing data sources like DataShop um, and others um, and try to make them where we can do analyses across these data sets. And there's a website out there. Um, we brought in the uh, data shop. We've also brought in um, Discourse DB, which is Carolyn Rose's uh, work, which you may have saw in her talk, uh, workshop yesterday. Um, also, Mook DB, which is an MIT uh, system, and Data Stage, which is um, uh, Stanford's data repository for all their edX and Coursera courses. Um, and we have a great team of Carnegie Mellon, uh, including myself, Ken Kadinger, and Carolyn. Um, also MIT and Stanford and the University of Memphis. And really the idea was that there's these different data silos and different time uh, uh, scales that people are collecting data on, as well as different data types. And it seemed that the different communities and different researchers were all doing their research sort of on these own spaces and not really um, going across and looking at these big questions that we want to do in learning analytics and things. So how can we um, enable uh, more work to be done across these different data uh, storage modules? And also we had this uh, um, issue with DataShop that a lot of people had data, they wanted to share their data potentially, but they didn't feel like they could put it on data shop server and store it at CMU. So to, to solve that problem, as part of LearnSphere, we're creating a distributed deployment and storage. Um, and we've started doing this with data shop and we now have multiple instances of data shop. We have one at uh, Memphis and one at Stanford and also at a couple of uh, companies. Um, and the idea is that you can store your data locally at your instance of data shop and the metadata all comes back to the centralized version. So people can know your data exists, but it gets around some of the privacy issues and uh, the storing of your data uh, on another school server. And finally, we've been working on uh, building a workflow uh, authoring environment, um, which again, if you were in my workshop yesterday, I could show a demo of this. Um, but the idea is not only do we want to share analysis, uh, share data, but we also want to share analyses. We want to be able to um, have people uh, show what they've been able, uh, how, how they got their uh, results uh, for their papers. And you know, in my dream world, I see, I, I envision a, a place where people will uh, write a paper, they'll share their data, and they'll share their analysis, and other people can then instantly go and run and uh, recreate the analysis, but also extend it. Um, so we've created now um, in various workshops that we've had at various conferences and stuff, we have about 20 different analyses that people have, have, have created. They're all on GitHub, and uh, if you go to learnsphere.org, you can get out there and uh, play with that as well. So some takeaways. Um, the amount of data that we have coming in, obviously, from educational technology is growing, and is growing exponentially. And I like to say big data is here in education. Um, I often get invited to big data kind of things with the physicists and the uh, medical people. And uh, I guess I always felt a little bit minimized in education, but not anymore. I mean, I think we are generating the kind of data that can actually um, do these, these uh, big, big kind of analytics things. Um, and again, students are more and more relying on technology. So it's critical that we can improve the learning in the ed tech that's out there. Um, I still don't think we're at a point where online courses compared to an in-person course. Um, I think we've made great strides in the last 10 years, but I, I, I think there's still room to keep improving. Not only that, but there is room to also improve teaching uh, courses where teachers are in the classroom. And I think these human-centered Data-driven approaches are, are the most likely ones to really succeed and make these actionable improvements uh, in ed tech. So thank you. Mm -hmm. We can take some questions. Yeah. Um, so on the, um, going back to where you were talking about the fit, of the automatically generated yes. models versus teacher generated ones. I guess uh, it, 
is it really surprising? I mean, so the, the, the automated ones are actually using as a resource the existing models, right? Is it, or is, it, is that wrong? And secondly, when they were evaluated, were they ever evaluated from their fit on data that wasn't used? Like overfitting. Yeah, so overfitting is, is potential in all of these. Um, um, but yeah, for the first part, yeah, we're using the models um, that were human generated, but we're using multiple different models. Right. So, uh, um, yeah, I'm just saying that it's not surprising then that you can find a way to take these individual and models and like search for a way of combining them that fits better and then showing that they fit better. Right? Sure. But I mean, I'm just wondering what's the what do you think that means? Right. So, well, the, the, the interesting thing is when you go back then and look and, and you see what caused that to happen, and the, the, the fact that we started with these human generated tag models, we can go back and figure out why it happened. And you see things, uh, and again, I like to use these toy examples like the geometry area because it's, um, it, it, it's intuitive, makes sense to most people who have geometry, but doing things like merging, working forward and backwards to find area. Um, for the different ones. Uh, it turns out like some of them are harder, like circle area is not, it's better to keep that split, but things like square and parallelogram, it doesn't matter if you're working forward or backwards, you can track that as one skill. So um, in the grand scheme of things, what, what does it matter? You get more efficiency, right? That's really what we're trying to do. Um, it isn't exactly surprising that we can always find a better model because yeah, you're right, we're doing, we're going over this massive search space but uh, I guess the, the key takeaway is there are better models out there. Yeah. yeah. So, building on Jeremy's question, uh, you know, when you find a better model, is it something that's immediately explainable or understandable to, to the lecturer who's provisioning you with that data? So, you mentioned this anecdotal story where you call back and say, hey, I have a better model, and the lecturer's not, not really interested in talking about it. But uh, when, when the lecturers do view it, is it the case that they can understand the model that is being discovered by the machine? Or is it it's not always the case. Um, it's usually the case we can figure out why the model came out better. Um, but sometimes there are some weird things that happen, like circle area gets merged with trapezoid area, and it turns out that those are both just hard skills. Those are the kind of the hardest area skills, and they kind of hold those together as the hardest problem, and you got a better fit. Should those be merged? No, probably not. Um, that's just kind of an overfitting kind of thing. So it's not always the case, um, but we've had multiple cases in multiple domains uh, in physics and in this uh, we have an engineering statics uh, course that we've done this about and, and have found improvements that the teachers were like, wow, yeah, that makes sense. And also related to that, I was wondering about the division of labor between what the instructor does and what your analytics team does, and I can imagine you say, okay, I have this tool available, the instructors are not very easy to use by themselves, but uh, how, how much uh, assistance or service do you have to provide in your unit in order to get an instructor willing to use uh, your tool first to get the analytics and second to, to receive feedback from it in, in a way that helps their teaching? Yeah, so it's been a multi-stage kind of thing to get adoption, and, and it's really, it's actually started outside of my group with the people who are developing the Open Learning Initiative and actually developing these courses online, and they've been a big, uh, a big help in getting the instructors uh, to build, move their courses in there with the expectation that they would have these analytics, so the instructors are interested in learning, they like seeing the learning curves, and again, I, I can't tell you how amazing it is when you're working with someone and you see these curves start to form. You have data all over the place and then you fit it with a new model and you have these smooth curves. And like it, it, it's, uh, it's a good feeling for the instructors too because they're like, oh, you know, I'm, I, I'm able to see that data. And that's super important too because then if you have this dashboard that's driven by these predictions of these skills that you put in as your learning objectives or whatever, it's critical that they're predicting what you think they're predicting. <laughs> And so as you get better models, the, the uh, instructors and the professors feel more comfortable with it as well. Um, there's definitely, we, we, we are not, I'm not doing this, this is purely a research project that we've kind of incorporated into that, and we do run several uh, seminars and we work with individual instructors who need help. Um, but most of the instructors, once they get it, they start doing it on their own. Uh, you know, we, we haven't had a lot of uh, 
instructors, uh, but more than 10 have done it and are doing it on their own now continuously. Yeah. So, so you mentioned a math example and an engineering example. Yeah. If you're on programming, you've seen uh, similar results where people have decomposed programming problems. And yeah, um, definitely. And uh, programming is a big area that uh, there's a lot more research going on just because of the nature of the type of assignments that we have. Um, but in the OLI courses that are doing programming that have these kind of skill taggings with the interactive um, uh, activities, we, they, they have done that in several of them. And we're working on several more of the programming ones, obviously, at CMU, because there's some uh, uh, highly uh, uh, important courses that have a lot of students in them. Um, yeah. And for the OLI courses, are, are you seeing smooth learning curves appear for the specific skills or absolutely yeah yeah definitely um, and it is the case with some of those online courses um, to create a curve we have to have at least three points to create a good curve uh, and often if teachers will only put in one or two problems on a specific skill so it does require working with them to get them to understand what we're trying to do and say you know really to assess this problem you need more than one opportunity Show the student has the skill. So a lot of it is working with them to improve, uh, create more opportunities, uh, create more problems, create more interactive problems that give you multiple chances to show skills. Yes. With both general respect to how we are uh, going to use items in machine learning, future of machine learning in this domain of uh, learning analytics. Uh, partly my concerns are. At, address, uh, at the point Kathleen and Dragon have been making for the past two years. So, my, my research is also based on group data, and, and this is something I try to address. Uh, we are, so when we are starting out, uh, to, if you want to deploy a model, you, you need a lot of data. So, if you start, it, it, so everyone has to uh, develop a new model for their own course. That's how it seems like. You are a lot of soil chain. Sharing an example of uh, physics and then maths, right? Now, universities are always going to be starting new courses, uh, and there are going to be changes to these courses every time. Right? Does that mean that I have to throw away the model that I created last time? Uh, create something new? No, yeah, no, you wouldn't have to. The question was, would you have to create a new model every time you create or change a course? And no, that's definitely not the case. Um, you can use what you have. And uh, some of these models do transfer. Um, it is the case that uh, the actual educational technology, the system you're using also matters. So just taking that my geometry area model and slapping it into someone else's geometry may not fit. But you know, in general, those skills should be largely transferable and should be a good start. Um, did you have a yeah, that, that, does it make sense to like uh, develop algorithms and machine learning algorithms to adapt to such changes? Yeah, I, I think that would be great. And uh, just to give you an idea of the way that we generally start when we're working with new instructors that come in, um, particularly with the online courses, they have uh, brought it in at the level of like learning objectives. And we'll say, okay, first tag everything with your learning objectives. And we can do that automatically, actually. And we can just go through and uh, tag the uh, based on learning objectives. And again, typically that's too high of a granularity. You're not gonna get these smooth learning curves. But we can, we can see these bumps and say, okay, you said that these are both teaching the same learning objective. Why is this one harder? And then they'll say, they almost always they go, well, that's harder because it has, you have to do this. And we're like, okay, well, let's add that skill in. And then, you know, we work from there. We do a couple iterations like that. And uh, this is all stuff that they can, they can make this tagging in Excel and then we can just load it up into the system and see how it fits. Right. So can there be any uh, transfer across institutions? Say, we are running a geometry process at ADUS. Would your models be any adaptable? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I think uh, uh, all our models are out there and uh, we can share them. There's also, uh, there have been uh, some other um, efforts to try to kind of define some of these learning models. Um, uh, Shenzhen, uh, is going to talk tomorrow about uh, XAPI, which is the Experience API. That's a, uh, an idea that came out of the Department of Defense in the United States to kind of standardize learning. And part of that is creating these community of practice that build specific domain type models. Yeah. 
So it strikes me that, um, so you talked about these experiments where from the same course there were models that the teachers developed and you found a better model for that course. If there were people who had models for geometry courses but not this geometry course, could you use the same approach to take models from a variety of geometry courses and create one for a new course? Is that the Yeah, I'd like to see that. Yeah, I haven't seen any other models from other courses yet. But yeah, if we had if we got if we build a big enough community and we're creating these across different courses and things, it would be interesting to see if we could predict and build models that could predict across them. Okay, so let's thank our speaker again.